Good afternoon, Greens. My name is Michael O'Neill and welcome to How Greens Get Things Done. This is a weekly live stream brought to you by the Green Party of New York. And I'm your friendly Green Party of New York State staff organizer. And on this live stream, we talk about the tips, tricks, tools, and techniques that you can use to build the Green Party to run more competitive campaigns as Greens and to add value to social movements and community struggles near you. This week, we're gonna be talking about the advice for rookie organizers. And when I say rookie organizers, I am basically talking about everybody. We're all rookies in this at this point. I'm a rookie organizer, you're a rookie organizer. Everybody's a rookie organizer. Uh, if you look at this on a long enough timeline, you know, stretching back to the, you know, 1920s and 30s where the um, militant labor movement working in conjunction with socialists, anarchists, and communists helped to uh, strike and perform other kinds of direct action that won a lot of the reforms that today we take for granted, uh, such as the 40-hour work week, um, social security, basic job protections, and including job safety measures. That all came out of an organizing tradition that went away for a while. And it went away for a lot of reasons, uh, largely due to McCarthyism and the Red Scares following World War II. And so I'm a big fan of a writer, author, organizer, academic named Jane McAlevey, who has devoted a lot of the last few years to trying to um, reintroduce a lot of the organizing methodology from that militant time of the 20s and 30s, uh, you know, leading up to the New Deal and trying to um, reintroduce that and reapply that to the kind of activism and movements that we find ourselves engaged in today. And one of the big distinctions that Jane McAlevey makes is between organizing and mobilizing. And a lot of what people call mobilizing, or pardon me, a lot of what people call organizing uh, is actually mobilizing. And this is especially the case online. We say, oh, the person's an organizer, that candidate is an organizer. Chances are they're mobilizing. What's the difference? Mobilizing is about getting people off the couch to do something, to click a like button, sign a petition, either virtually or whatever, to show up to vote, to give money, to call a state representative or congressperson. That's all mobilizing. And mobilizing is important. Mobilizing is necessary. But mobilizing tends to follow a kind of um, top-down approach, right? There's something that needs to be done that has been designated by the managers of a campaign, and they need a lot of people to do that thing. And so they're trying to mobilize those people to go out and do that thing that has been decided on by the campaign organizers. Again, this is not an inherently bad thing, but it's not organizing. So what is organizing? Organizing is about trying to build new leaders. It's about trying to raise the organizing capacity of other people, people who um, are either newly involved or people who have been involved and now we are trying to get them to be involved at a uh, higher level of a strategic mindset, of, of activity, of uh, being able to introduce other people, right, who are newer than them into the struggle and in, into the work of how we win. And uh, organizers try to pass on the skills of struggle to other people in their community. And they try to use their experience and their knowledge to walk newer people through the steps of a, a organizing fight in order to uh, help those newer people understand uh, what is happening and what's going to happen next so that uh, people are um, not mystified or needlessly scared by the opposition that we encounter as we are fighting for what we need and want to 
live better as a society, to just achieve you know, basic dignity as workers, to fight for the preservation of our environment. So that's organizing. It's creating new leaders and it's, um, it's developing the capacity of existing leaders so that they can work at another gear, at another level. And organizing uh, takes time and it takes a lot of investment and it cannot be done with just you know, email blasts and, and phone banking. It relies on one-on-one -on -one relationships and building trust and it is essential there are no shortcuts around organizing, actual organizing. And so Jane McAlevey, and everything I've said up to this point in this episode is cribbed from Jane McAlevey. And you can look for her on YouTube. You can uh, find a number of articles from her online. You can buy or otherwise uh, borrow maybe from a library one of her two books. The first is called Raising Expectations and Raising Hell. The second newer book is called No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in a Gilded Age. And if you ever have a chance to listen to or read Jane McAlevey, I highly recommend it. She is bringing forth important methodologies, uncovering methodologies that have been obscured by the sands of time and also just, you know, red baiting McCarthyist BS. So. I want to talk about a um, feature of some articles that she's written and also of her book, No Shortcuts. And I was reminded of this because I was listening to a Jane McAlevey lecture on YouTube earlier this week, as I sometimes do when my spirits are uh, flagging. And there is a um, pamphlet that was used in uh, the New England 1199 Union, which was a nationwide union prior to merging with SEIU. And uh, I mean, SEIU 1199 is still around, but they used to be their own independent national union. And they had a pamphlet called Advice for Rookie Organizers. And it's something that Jane brought up in a recent lecture. And I, it's something I posted to a Green Party of New York State Facebook group uh, last year. And I thought it might be worth revisiting for this episode. And I want to uh, take you through this, uh, this little uh, list of, of advice for rookie organizers that I, I took the liberty of adapting somewhat to make it more immediately applicable to Green Party work. Because we are talking about advice that was written in the context of union organizing. And there's a lot of crossover between union organizing and organizing for a political party or within movements, but they're not quite the same. And so I just changed a few words here and there. And I think I was able to preserve the, um, the integrity of the document. So, and again, I'm talking about advice for rookie organizers. I did not, uh, I did not write this advice. I consider myself to be a rookie organizer. I think we all need to ad adopt a rookie mindset as we attempt to build our party and as we attempt to blaze a trail for becoming a, you know, the electoral arm for the left. And so without further ado, let's dive into it. I'm going to bring up the magic window here so you can see what I'm seeing. All right, looking at advice for rookie organizers adapted for green party building and i link to an article where jane talks about this uh, list of organizing advice uh, along with other uh, aspects of organizing history that she's been writing about and researching for a couple years now so number one get close to the membership stay close to the membership now a lot of what we go over here in this list of advice for rookie organizers may sound painfully obvious. And in some ways it is, but in other ways, it's really easy to forget when you are caught up in the work a day aspect of organizing, of trying to build a party and run a party or a committee or a county organization. It's easy to fall into the traps of neglecting some of these, uh, points of advice, as obvious as they may seem. And also, while they may seem obvious and they may even seem simple, 
that doesn't necessarily make them easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. And while a lot of these principles are simple in concept, they require some discipline and effort to actually carry out. Now, that doesn't mean they're not worth doing. They're totally worth doing. And in fact, they're essential to do. But getting close to the membership, staying close to the membership, when you're in a leadership position, whether it's an official elected position within an organization or something that's more de facto and informal, it's easy to get caught up in just the work, right? Just the, the technocratic, uh, logistical work of it, right? And become isolated and even alienated from the members that you're supposed to be representing. You start thinking to yourself, well, they don't know what it's like to be in my position. Uh, they don't know what it's like to have this responsibility. And uh, that is a not productive direction to go in. And so we who aspire to be organizers, who aspire to be leaders within the Green Party or within the left, need to stay as close to our members as possible. And it takes a conscious effort to be uh, getting in touch with newly registered Greens in your area, uh, new members of committees to make sure that people feel welcome. It, it, it's an active process. It, it's a muscle that you have to exercise to stay close to the membership. And that is the most important way of building the antibodies against elitism and, uh, and, and encroaching alienation between uh, leaders or just the people who are doing the lion's shares of the work, as frequently happens in mostly volunteer organizations, and then the membership. And it is by getting close to the mem membership that you discover and find the capacities of your next generation of leaders or uh, highly active volunteers and high participation members. So get close to the membership and stay close to the mem membership, whether it's the members of your county organization, your working committee, your fellow state committee members, or uh, just your rank and file Greens. All right, number two, tell Greens it's their party and then behave that way. And this is something that uh, within the Green Party of New York, we try to include in our messaging that this is your party, right? And one of the kind of most direct aspects of it being our party, right, all of us together as Greens, is that we are the ones who have to do the work and we are the ones who have to fund it and supply the resources and volunteer time and expertise. There is no one who's going to save us. There's no one who's going to step in with a magical grant that's just going to have a set for a year or a few years. And uh, but beyond this rhetoric, right, we have to behave that way. So those of us who are elected members of the state committee or executive committee or who are staff like me, like we really have to commit to behaving like the party belongs to you, the membership. And again, it's not good intentions aren't enough. We have to actually take steps to proactively live that and, and proactively give opportunities uh, for our rank and file greens to live the experience of owning this party. And again, this applies to your county organization, to your neighborhood local, to your working committee. Um, always remind greens that it's their party, but then all, we all have to behave that way. And there's a flip side of that coin of, of you know, leaders need to devolve um, decision making and encourage high participation whenever possible. And those of us who either in general or within a given um, scenario are not a leader of that, uh, of that particular aspect of the party or are not leaders in the party in a formal sense, right, in an elected sense, that doesn't mean that we can just take that time off, right? That doesn't mean that we can just skate on by and let the elected leaders do the work. We have to participate to uh, demonstrate our own ownership of the party. Don't do for Greens what they can do. That is a really nice transition from what we were just talking about, right? It's um, as organizers, as leaders, we need to, whenever possible, th be thinking about uh, who in the rank and file, who in the members of my committee or what have you can do this thing rather than me doing it myself. 
in volunteer organizations, it is a extremely common tendency for just a handful of people to do almost all of the work. And there's a syndrome that you fall into where you think that it's going to take more time and effort to delegate a task than to just do it yourself. And so you end up just doing everything yourself. And there are two big problems with that. One, it's probably impossible for you to do everything yourself. And the second problem is that if you're doing everything yourself, you are not developing and strengthening the leading and organizing capacities of your fellow greens. And so even if it takes more time to delegate and explain how to do a task to another green, it still needs to happen because that way, maybe, maybe it took longer for that particular instance, but the next time that you ask that green to do a particular thing, that, that same thing that you explained before, that green will be able to do it uh, much quicker and more efficiently, and you are building that green's confidence. You are building that green's um, capacity to um, participate and then eventually to lead and explain that task to another green who then will use that as an opportunity to build their organizing skills, their party building skills. So um, don't do for greens what they can do. It's uh, dramatically important from a, a, a practical perspective in terms of many hands making light work. And it's also uh, important from the perspective of uh, you know this being a truly member-run, member-owned party and developing the next generation of leaders. The party is not a fee for service. It is the collective experience of greens and allies in struggle. And so in a union context, fee for service frequently refers to a kind of unionism where Members just pay their dues and then they expect the union to negotiate them a good contract and to handle their grievances. And that is, uh, you know, from the perspective of someone like Jane McAlevey or other, you know, people from the socialist left, that's considered a very weak and thin uh, conception of, of unionism. Now, in our context for the Green Party, we need to think of ourselves as more than just a ballot line were not just an easy way for people to get on the ballot, right? And it's not just a way to elect Greens that then we want them to do all the work for us once they're in office. This needs to be a collective experience of all of us as members and members with our allies in a struggle together. We're trying to build a better world. Uh, even if we elect, even when we elect people to higher and higher offices, that's not the end goal of this party. The goal of this party is achieving the four pillars of the international green movement, which is social justice, grassroots democracy, ecological wisdom, and a nonviolent society. And so that's, a, that's an experience that we have to live together and participate in together collectively. And it's not just a, a, an electoral mechanism that we are maintaining and stewarding. Number five, the party's function is to assist members in making a positive change in their lives. That's building a, a bit on number four, right? This is, the, the function is not just to elect our, our friends and allies into positions of power so that then we, we can feather our own nest, right? The, the function is to make a positive change in our lives, in our communities, in the context of our, our local government and, and and larger scales of government after that, and, and also outside of electoralism, in fighting on issues it, through uh, direct action and through issue campaigns and an allied struggle with social movements to improve our lives. Number six, greens are made of clay, not glass. What do we mean by that? Well, especially with new members and and this is related to a lot of different organizations not just the green party uh, which is why this um, advice i think is so powerful there is an inclination to want to shield rank and file members especially newer members from 
somewhat harsh realities, from somewhat gritty truths about what it will take to win a fight, to win a struggle, about what it takes to build this organization. And when we are uh, fearful of sharing those truths with our rank and file brothers and sisters, that is when we are treating our greens as glass, right? We, are, we think that if we apply pressure to them, they're just gonna break, that they're gonna crumble. And that is not a way to build a fighting organization. Number one, uh, our green brothers and sisters are, are stronger than that. They can take the uh, realities. And in fact, we, we have to be able to accept the realities of what it takes to win, whether it's winning a campaign for office or winning an issue campaign for ranked choice voting and proportional representation or for affordable housing. Now, what do we mean by what, saying that greens are made of clay? Well, when we apply that pressure, rather than them breaking, they will actually be molded right? We are molding and shaping ourselves and our fellow rank and file greens to build our capacities, to raise our game, to learn new skills, and to be able to um, withstand the pressure and in fact be shaped by the pressure so that we become a more effective fighting organization and we become more effective, high participating greens. So that's what we mean when we say that greens are made of clay, not of, of glass. Don't be afraid to ask greens to build their own party, building off of what we just said, right? It's, uh, we f are concerned frequently that it, it's an imposition or that it's too much to ask of our fellow Greens to step up and build their own party. And it's a natural feeling, but it's also an unproductive instinct. We have to push that aside. We have to accept that we're trying to save the world here, right? We're trying to stop climate change. We're trying to win universal single payer health insurance that's gonna dramatically improve people's lives and potentially save the planet from a catastrophic Anthropocene driven climate catastrophe, right? So we have to be willing to ask each other to build this party that belongs to us. So don't be afraid to ask Greens to build their own party. Number eight, don't be afraid to confront them, them being Greens, when they don't. So this is a, an advice that is kind of putting forward some tough love, right? When Greens, when members, shrink back from participation, from stepping forward, from carrying their share of the leadership that we have to be willing to confront each other to, to tell Greens that it's their party and that we expect them to behave that way. And that's a tricky thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. And you know, we all need to have a rookie mindset when it comes to that. And we always need to do this in a sense of comradeship and love and support. It's, I think, important to note that it's saying don't be afraid to confront Greens when they don't. Not don't be afraid to attack, right? Or undermine or call out, okay? It's, it's confronting, but it's confronting in a way that is steeped in uh, mutual respect and a sense of, of seeking connection and uh, mutual understanding. Number nine, don't spend your time organizing greens who are already organizing themselves. Go to the biggest worst. And this is kind of a, a macro piece of advice. And I guess, you know, at, at the level that maybe works at, in your neighborhood organization or your county organization or your committee is um, the temptation is just to spend the time with those members who are already participating at a high level, who are already really adding value and then the people who uh, maybe are newer or not as experienced to just kind of leave them on their own. And again, that's a, a natural instinct, but ultimately it's unproductive. So we need to exercise the discipline in ourselves to lean into those greens who uh, need some help, need some support, need some mentoring, and try to, again, raise their capacities, raise their leadership 
uh, potential and their uh, potential to contribute. Number 10, we are halfway through. The working class builds cells for its own defense, identify them and recruit their leaders. This gets to a point that Jane McAlevey and others have called organic worker leaders or organic leaders. And the idea is that within any community or any group, whether it is a shop floor or a uh, floor of a hospital or a, within a school or within a neighborhood, there are always individuals who have won the respect of their peers and are trusted by their peers. And these are referred to as organic leaders. Now these people may occupy some formal position of leadership, uh, some kind of a, a steward role or a managerial role or an elected position, but frequently they do not occupy a formal position of leadership, but nonetheless, they are looked at as leaders by their peers. It's our job to identify those people, recruit them, and through them reach their peers so that uh, they are able to communicate the importance of uh, joining and participating in the Green Party. And these are people who are good prospects to run as candidates and being liaisons to broader social movements that we want to support. And again, the more modern term is uh, organic leaders or organic worker leaders. Here they refer to them as uh, cells for the defense of the working class. All right, uh, number 11, anger is there before you are, channel it, don't diffuse it. So when you are working with a group of people who are new, who uh, maybe they have been angered by the results of a previous election, or by a particularly dastardly elected official in their community who's done something horrible recently and they're really fired up and they wanna do something about it and they're, they see the Green Party as a potential vehicle for that action, channel that, don't diffuse it. Again, easier said than done. Maybe it's an obvious point, but it's still a, um, it's still a point that requires a lot of tact and savvy to put into action. Because on the one hand, you want to uh, help those new people kind of build the steps that they need to build an effective campaign, whether it's an electoral campaign or an a, um, issue campaign. And those steps might be different than the steps that they have in mind as a group of new people who are highly energized and angry and ready to take action. And so how can you, on the one hand, um, shepherd them into uh, steps that, that you believe will help effect, build an effective campaign? Maybe initiate would be a better way to put it. Um, but at the same time, you're not dismissing what they want to do and the tactics that they have in mind already. It's a balance, and it takes maybe some experimentation to figure out that balance. Number 12, channeled anger builds a fighting organization. So when your greens are angry, find a way to direct that anger, that anger towards the fight, towards a way that makes it, um, that, that gets a win for them and for the organization. We get angry about a lot of stuff these days on social media, you know, whatever, you know, recent scandal there is in your local government or the state government. But how do we channel that into building a fighting organization? Usually that means connecting that anger to the underlying issue at stake, to what are the systemic issues that this is representing, and then what action can we take to attack those systemic problems. Number 13, greens know the risks, don't lie to them. Deep down, someone who is thinking about running for office as a Green understands that there are risks to crossing the two-party corporate state, that there are things that are put in place by the corporate parties and their corporate allies and their foundations and their elected officials and their uh, different enforcement agencies uh, of, of the bureaucratic state that can be used to punish people who cross the street against the two corporate parties. Those risks exist. 
And our job is not to sugarcoat those or to lie about those. Uh, we need to meet people where they are and say, yes, here are the risks. There's a risk to any attempt to improve our lives collectively. But ultimately, our best bet is through collective action. And by working together, we can mitigate those risks. We can do what we can to look out for each other. And in the end, it will be worth it because we will win justice. But we cannot ignore those risks or lie about them. Number 14, every green or potential green is showtime. Communicate energy, excitement, urgency, and confidence. So when a new person comes to your neighborhood meeting, you might be thinking, oh, this is just our little meeting that we have here in the meeting room of the neighborhood library. And, you know, who are we, right? We're just a small group of, small club of greens. You know, we're doing our thing. We're plugging along. When you're close to it, when you're part of the everyday in and out of, you know, trying to get people to a meeting, organizing a meeting agenda, we, we don't think of ourselves in those moments as like being on the vanguard of something exciting and urgent and, uh, and confident. But that's what new people need to see. We have to remind ourselves that even at the most mundane level, we are trying to build something great here. We're trying to build something to uh, stop climate change, right? To dramatically improve the lives of, of countless people, not just in this country, but around the world. And so when new people show up to your meeting, even if it is in a church basement or the back room of a library or whatever, it's showtime, right? For those new greens, you don't know what kind of expectations they have. It might have been a big deal for them to come to this. Maybe they've never gone to a political meeting in their lives, right? And so it's showtime when we meet those new people in the sense of, of again, communicating energy, excitement, urgency, and confidence proactively going up, shaking their hand, looking them in the eyes and saying, hi, welcome. Uh, how did you find out about this? Uh, what, are there any issues that you are in, interested in in particular? And you don't want to be um, you know, maniacal about it. You don't want to be creepy or come across as creepy. Uh, you want to give people their space and give them time to get acclimated, but you want to communicate to them that we are interested in their interest and we are excited to talk to them about what they're interested in and how they are thinking about getting involved or any questions that they have. So every green or potential green that you meet is showtime. And we have to represent the potential of this party, even when we might be feeling a little bit dragged down by just the day in day out logistics of printing sign up sheets and entering emails into databases and, and things like that. Again, this is an obvious point, but it's not necessarily easy. Number 15, there is enough oppression in communities not to be oppressed by organizers. So this is a special admonition to organizers and leaders within the party that uh, it is vital that we not replicate the systems of oppression that uh, we see in the broader world that we are attempting to overturn in the broader world. And so uh, we must bring an intersectional mindset to how we are administering and governing our organizations, our parties, and make sure that we are living that um, at the level of one-on-one -on -one interaction with our fellow Greens. Organizers talk too much. Much of what you say is forgotten. And I'm, I'm sure this is a, a, a point of advice that I could, I would benefit from spending a lot of time meditating on, and surely I, I will. Um, there's a, another way to phrase this, which is that organizers have two ears and one mouth, and the reason we have that is because we should be listening twice as much as we are talking, and this is really key. One of the best ways to show someone that you're interested in them is to listen to them. And there's a future episode idea I have in mind, which is um, uh, conversation skills for shy greens. When you when you're you're supposed to go up and talk to like a new person, like I was just talking about, right? But what do you say to that person? Not all of us have the gift of gab, and that's okay. Um, it's not really about 
you saying interesting things. It's about you communicating that you're interested in what they have to say and learning what kinds of questions you can ask to tease out people's interests in a way that makes them feel welcome and accepted and comfortable. Number 17, communicate to Greens that there is no salvation beyond their own power. And boy, every time I see a Facebook comment about um, a particular unnamed politician that uh, Greens or other leftists are waiting to just, you know, that, the, the, to just join the party and, and make this just unstoppable force. If we could only get this one person, if we just got this one person to join us, oh, then we'd be set. Oh, we would be really taken off then. No, no, sorry. There are no shortcuts. There is no salvation beyond our own power, period. Block by block, school district by school district, city council district by city council district, assembly district by assembly district, state senate district by state senate district, congressional district by congressional district, okay? State by state. That is how we build the party. It is through us. It is through you and me and anyone that we can find to convince, to uh, recruit other people, to participate in building the party at the molecular level, to get Greens together into rooms where we are learning and doing things together, to build our capacities, to have an impact on issues, to run competitive campaigns. That is where our salvation lies. With you and me together in a room doing the work not in some elected federal official deciding that he or she has seen the light and is now going to join the Green Party. If slash when that happens, great. But that, that is gonna be a product of us doing the work, not a shortcut around doing the work. Number 18, workers united can beat the bosses and the bosses parties. You have to believe that and so do they right? Greens, workers, community members united, we can beat the corporate parties. That is a truth. We can win the reforms needed to make it easier to build the corporate parties. Is it going to necessarily happen with a particular election or a particular election cycle? Not necessarily. But if we keep doing the work, we will get stronger. We will get closer. We will demonstrate to more people that we are a competitive party, that we are having an impact on social movements. And through that progress, we will eventually attain victory. We have to be strategic, we have to be disciplined, but it is possible. I believe that, I need you to believe that, we need to make sure that other Greens believe that. Number 19, don't estimate the workers. We cannot, uh, Jane McAlevey in that uh, lecture that, you know, kind of put me on the path to doing this episode, she talked about how organizers have an unfailing confidence and belief in the capacity of everyday people to do extraordinary things. And that is the history of social progress of, in the world, is of everyday people discovering through each other how they are capable of doing extraordinary things. And we cannot underestimate each other. We can, certainly must not underestimate the rank and file, both of our own party and of those movements that we wish to support and be a part of. Number 20, we lose when we don't put workers into struggle, when we don't put greens into struggle. We have to find uh, ways for greens to join in the fight whether it's a fight for elected office, whether it's a fight on an issue campaign. We constantly need to be in a, a street, strategic way, be putting ourselves into struggles so that we are building those muscles, so that we are honing our skills. Now that doesn't mean just you know, flitting from issue to issue, right? In a way that disperses our power, disperses our energy, but by making sure that in some way we are in the struggle, we are in the fight and contributing and doing our part. So that's uh, number 20. So if you're just joining us, my name is Michael O'Neill. This has been How Greens Get Things Done. I've been talking about 1199's advice to rookie organizers. 
which is a organizing pamphlet that they've been using for generations. I learned about it through a writer, scholar, organizer named Jane McAlevey. You can find uh, her lectures and writings online. It's featured in a book that she put out uh, maybe last year or a couple of years ago called No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the Gilded Age. Maybe it's a new Gilded Age since we already had a Gilded Age in the past. And so, uh, yeah, I've been I've, I've adapted this list of advice to rookie organizers slightly. So it's more uh, directly applicable to green work that we do because it was originally written for specifically union organizing. And again, as far as rookie organizers go, I'm a rookie organizer. You're a rookie organizer. We are all rookie organizers at this point. We all have a lot of learning to do and a lot of teaching to do with each other. There is a path to victory. And so I hope that some of these points of advice have made an impact on you as they have made an impact on me. I, like you, will continue to attempt to put these into practice in my daily work as a green. And it's a step-by-step -step process. We just gotta keep learning, keep getting better, keep fighting. And I wanna thank you for sharing your time on a Sunday afternoon with me I'm Michael O'Neill, friendly Green Party of New York staff organizer. On, green, on how greens get things done, we talk about the tips, tools, tricks, and techniques needed to build the party, run competitive campaigns, and add value to social movements. I'll be back next week at 4 p.m. You can uh, look for the Green Party of New York YouTube page, and we have an archive of episodes on there. I promise as soon as I turn this camera off, I'm going to work on uh, uh, getting our, uh, my most recent episodes on that YouTube page and building out our archive on our website. I see a comment through, from Chris saying, well done, thanks for putting this together. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for that uh, very generous feedback, for that uh, positive support. That means a lot to me. If you liked this episode, if you like other episodes of How Greens Can Get Things Done, please share them to your uh, Green Party comrades and to other friends and allies that you have within the left. And if you have any questions or other comments, please email me, michael at gpny.org. Again, that's michael at gpny.org. Or you can leave a comment right here on this uh, Facebook video post, just like Chris did. So... Thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday.